Veracity has what we call report repository storage plugins. Um, currently, Veracity ships with only one implementation of how repositories are stored, and it is a plugin we call FS3. And basically, it stores blobs. Uh, the, the Veracity architecture is remarkably similar to Git, by the way. It's blobs and, um, and uh, deduplication and hashing and indexes and things like that. It stores blobs in uh, one big file, and it keeps an index of where they are. And when the file gets to a gig, it cuts it off and starts another one. So it's, it's not terribly complicated. But all of that functionality is wrapped in an API, which allows the rest of Veracity to not care how it works. And we have other implementations of the same API that allow us to store in things like Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, we haven't shipped those implementations because they, they didn't get quite through the QA process and so forth. And some of those implementations we may very well not open source. Um, I suspect when we do an Oracle implementation, we're going to charge a lot of money for that. Uh, but the fact is, we think that uh, that API gives us some flexibility to have all kinds of different trade-offs on how repositories are stored. And we've done some work to prove that the API does accomplish what we want. Um, minor thing, but it's a difference. Veracity, like the other tools of its kind, uh, does use SHA-1 as a default hash, but we also have support for SHA-2 and SCAN at uh, 256 bits or 512. For, for those who are uh, already nervous about SHA-1, uh, we just kind of built that capability in right from the beginning. For a long time, our repository was uh, SHA-2-256. Our public repository right now is running back on SHA-1. Uh, there is actually a performance penalty for using the larger hashes, obviously. I mean, it seems like a little thing, and it is, but uh, when you go with the larger hashes, things get bigger. I mean, moving bigger things around takes a little bit more time. So, uh, Nonetheless, we uh, just kind of looking forward. We built those things in from the beginning. Um, Veracity has file locks. <laughs> They're optional. They, they certainly aren't on by default. Um, we mostly discourage their use. But um, one of the questions is, why on earth would you create file locks in the DBCS? And the answer is, seriously, some people need this. They really do. Um, and I'll admit that not as many people need this as there are people who think they need this. But uh, the gaming companies, for example, I mean, we, we happen to have a really uh, mainstream successful gaming studio right down the street from our office. And uh, you know, teams like that, you know, their 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 repository may be 500 gigabyte gigabytes, which um, a small percentage of its code and the rest of it is binary files, image files, graphic assets, all kinds of things that don't merge correctly. And these people are all on perforce. And they're all looking at the DBCS world saying, yeah, until you got the last hand doing this. So we, we added locks to the product in the hope that uh, we can uh, start the process of getting some traction, especially with gaming companies for, um, for the DCS. Yes, sir. Quick comment. Even those of us who aren't doing mass amounts of binary uh, would still really appreciate being able to say, well, I'm working on this document, whether it's in Word or OpenOffice, and it doesn't really merge well. So just let me have it until I'm done with my version, then you can have it. Absolutely. No, and that's, a, that's an equally valid use case. Uh, people use version control for stuff that doesn't merge. Um, Word, Excel, whatever. So um, we, uh, we, put the, uh, we put the feature in. I'll be the first to admit that we had to make some compromises in the implementation of the feature. Uh, it's not, essentially, it's one of those features that only works when you have a live network connection. It's not like, you know, locking when you're offline is not going to work. Or more to the point, it doesn't. Doesn't help. So um, anyway, that uh, that feature is uh, there for people to to start trying out. Um, Veracity has an embedded scripting language, um, which isn't really so much of a difference for say Mercurial, which is written in Python and so forth. But um, our uh, our scripting language is JavaScript. We embed the SpiderMonkey interpreter, and that's uh, used for. You know, all the usual things, plugins, our already test suite is largely written in JavaScript. And then there's a few things that uh, we that are so scary that we expose them only through the JavaScript layer so that people won't do them and things like that. So um, anyway. 
Uh, Veracity has um, a, a feature we call user accounts. And this is, a, this is a distinction that we've just started implementing. We haven't really done as much with this as we plan to use in the future. Uh, but when, when the world went from, say, Subversion, which has a centralized user account system, to Git Mercurial, where it will just kind of, you can enter about any string to identify yourself that you want, uh, we lost a certain amount of centralized administration control. And Veracity is in the process of trying to bring some of that back. So uh, users in Veracity have a canonical user ID. Right now, that feature in Veracity 1.0 actually doesn't do much. So I, I don't want to uh, make claims that are not yet true. But um, we, we foresee that having the ability to do a lot of different administration and permissions type things um, that, uh, that a lot of uh, corporate and enterprise customers are going to really want. So. Veracity has uh, built-in bug tracking. Um, this is a bug that I was supposed to fix for the last sprint and I didn't get to. And the verifier is not here, so I felt okay showing that. Um, Veracity also has a built-in uh, build tracking system. Um, which I always think makes a lovely slide because you can see the bills that fail over in that. So we have a continuous integration system that just ties in and reports build success, build failure, test success, test failure, and things like that. And this all shows up as part of the Veracity web UI. Um, we are a Scrum team, and so we built in a, a number of sort of Scrum specific features into Veracity, including burn down charts and iterations and sprints. And Things like that. Uh, this is this is a burndown chart. I can't remember which one it is. It might be it might be one of mine on the day. I chose a day where it looked actually kind of decent. Where the green line actually is a little annoying. So, Veracity also has what we call a decentralized database, and this is the thing that we used to build the features I just showed you: uh, bug tracking, the build tracking, user accounts. It's also used for comments, tags, and who and when to commit, to name branch references, and blocks. Basically, all the metadata of a version control system. Veracity stores all of that in a database thing, uh, which is decentralized in the same way that tree things are decentralized under regular version control. So just to give a little bit more information about how that works, because it's probably the main architectural difference between Veracity and things like it. Um, basically, Veracity has the same capability as Mercurial and Git for versioning trees, um, version records and files. But we also have this other capability to version things that are more like records and feeds. And this is a, an abstraction. It's not like we, uh, I mean, it's a database platform of a, of a sort. It's a small database platform. It's not trying to compete with SQL Server, but the abstraction is presented by the lower layers. As, as a record and fields concept, and it's used in just the same way that you manage versioned um, trees. So you have, just as you have tree chain sets, you have database chain sets, and you can push and pull them around, and databases take the form of a directed acyclic graph, just as they do with Git, and uh, that means that things have to be merged. So the concepts are all similar, even though the implementation under the hood is very, very different. <coughs> One of the first things I'd like to point out when I talk about the decentralized database, is that we have encountered no use case for intentionally branching a bug database. <laughs> um, when we first set out to create this, we weren't really sure where it was going to go. Um, there was some talk about, oh, we could branch the bug database, and we'd have this and that, and things like that. What it turned out to be is that everything we use a database for wants to be synced and merged as often as possible. So don't hear me say that the killer feature of a decentralized database is that you can start branching your comments there. It's, it, you don't want to do that, actually. And if somebody comes along with something that they really do want to branch that's database-oriented, then you know, we'll, we'll rethink this. But so far, we haven't found one. What we have is a decentralized thing of data that wants to be synced as often as you can. But when you're offline, it just degrades gracefully. That's, what, that's what basically what we've got here. 
the concept is, um, is all built around a template, uh, which is more or less equivalent to a SQL um, database schema. The template defines your record types and your fields, or your record types are more or less equivalent to the table. Uh, records by default are field by field merged. So if we have a bug and um, you modify the description of the bug and I modify the priority, by default, unless the template were to say otherwise, that is not a conflict. The system will merge that by taking your change and mine, integrating them into the same record, and just proceeding uh, without a problem. All of that is spelled out in the template. It is actually illegal in veracity to define a template that does not specify how to resolve all merge conflicts. So merging and syncing of veracity databases should always happen automatically because you cannot have a template which doesn't say how to do so. You can have a variety of different resolutions for conflicts. Uh, I'm not going to go into huge detail here, but you can have merge resolutions that use um, a variety of different reasons. So for example, uh, if two people modify the priority of the bug, and one person on the team is considered to have more authority than the other person, you can have the template say that person wins. Uh, you can have the, if one person, if the developer claims the bug is fixed and the tester claims he's not, it's not, well, you can have the tester win. Things like that. So all that's spelled out in the template. The other thing that happens in, um, in a decentralized database is if you have unique constraints, uh, there's a T that's in that word. Um, unique constraints can be violated, of course. And we have kind of two ways that we address that problem. One is that the system has ways of generating unique values that should be unique. So quite a bit, I mean, just like most other decentralized tools, for things that are not user visible, we rely on GUIs. I mean, globally unique identifiers are really handy when you need something that you just pretty darn sure is going to be unique. But for bug IDs, nobody wants a GUI. They're really long. They're not friendly looking. So we have ways of, uh, we have things where you can say, this is a, a field that should be unique. So generate a value that's likely to be unique but looks friendlier than a GUI. And then when conflicts actually do happen, where you and I both enter a bug and we somehow end up with two values that violate the unique constraint, the template has to specify how to fix that. One of the two values is going to get changed. And you can spell out in the template, change this one and here's how to change it. Things like that. So once again, merges never need user attention for a veracity database. They always happen. That way you can sync as often as you want. The syncing is going to be automatic. The merge shouldn't fail. Um, and the template has spelled out exactly how it will look after person. 